Hello, and welcome to the Discriminating Gamer, the board game review show that, when it was 18, briefly advised Napoleon. Ladies and gentlemen, today we're going to go ahead and take a look at Fields of Despair from GMT Games. In Fields of Despair from GMT Games, one player takes on the role of the Central Powers, Germany, Austria, etc., and the other player takes on the role of the Allies, France, England, and the United States of America, and Belgium. As they, of course, fight the World War, the First World War in Western Europe. Now, this is a block war game. Your game board is a map of the the Western Front during the war, uh, Western Germany, uh, Northeastern France, Belgium, uh, and Luxembourg. And essentially, you're going to go ahead and attempt to, over the course of different scenarios, uh, reach various victory objectives. Now, there are a series of phases here in every game. Now, depending on the scenario, you may not begin uh, right and, and just go, go them straight through. You may begin at certain parts, but essentially every round you're going to play through these different phases. First thing you're going to do is, of course, move this, this uh, USA entry marker one space to the right, essentially indicating how soon the United States will come into the war. Next, you're going to have kind of a resolve the Eastern Front. Now... The game is trying to capture kind of the entire experience of World War One, even though the actual action, the actual war, is just taking place on the Western Front. So this is kind of abstracted. Now you have a bag that's going to have several cubes in them, and you're going to be pulling out cubes to kind of see what happens. Now generally, if you pull out red cubes, you're going to uh, place those kind of on the board, um, and what's going to happen is they represent major Russian victories. And that's going to be a kind of a setback to your forces. So whatever number of units you have on this track uh, in the, dedicated to the Eastern Front is going to kind of go up or down depending on whether or not there's been, you know, Russian victories uh, or not on the, on the Eastern Front. Now, as this track plays out, it's going to be moving further and further toward the Russian Revolution. Once a revolution hits, that's going to free up units uh, from the Eastern Front to bring to the Western Theater. Next, you have a kind of production phase. Now, during this production phase, of course, there's going to be a lot of different things going on. I'm not going to go through all of them in detail, but suffice it to say, um, you're going to do uh, naval warfare for one. For instance, again, you're going to draw cubes out of a bag, the, the German player is. He can target, does he want to do unrestricted submarine warfare, meaning does he want to attack uh, kind of the Allies' economy, or does he want to target their troops? And he's going to hurt them in different ways like that. Um, but, but he's going to roll a die, consult a table to see what happens. Next, you're going to essentially collect economic points. These are cubes, black for the Central Powers, blue for the Allies, that then you can spend on different things. For instance, you can upgrade technologies, either in aviation or artillery. Uh, artillery, you can start using poison gas. Uh, your planes become kind of deadlier. But also, too, you can kind of increase your, your kind of logistical points, which you can spend in, in certain circumstances. You're going to kind of increase uh, your, your ability to uh, supply units. You can also husband some of these points to spend later. You even, of course, have the option to take them to bid on initiative to see if you can go first during the next round. Now, once you've made sure that all your units are in supply, that is, you can trace a direct line from your unit to uh, kind of to your bases, and you want to make sure that none of your units have been cut off, meaning they're completely surrounded by the enemy, uh, and that you have, of course, enough uh, kind of supply points um, to, to supply all of those hexes, you can go ahead then and get ready for the big showdown. Now, during the action phase, the very first thing you're going to do is kind of aerial reconnaissance. Now, you each have a number of little tokens that represent your uh, your fighters. Uh, I should say your aircraft. Now, your aircraft, um, you, you place them upside down so your opponent cannot see how strong they are. Now, at the beginning of the game, they can't fight because they're not equipped with weapons yet. But as the game progresses, your technology progresses, you, of course, can arm them. You, you, you can fight with them. 
Um, but essentially what you do is uh, you've got your blocks facing you, your opponent's blocks facing him, so it's a fog of war. You don't know what their blocks uh, have revealed. You go ahead, you place their... Um, uh, your, your fighters on their blocks, and you know during once you've got to the point where you can fight your opponent, he can place fighter units there, and you kind of go back and forth around the board placing these units. You even have some that just bluff. Um, well, what's going to happen then is you, of course, reveal those units, and you fight. You've got aerial combat, dice rolls, and then assuming the the person who placed there first gets through, he can see a number of your blocks, so he kind of gets an idea of what's awaiting him if he attacks that zone or if he doesn't. Next, you have movement. So you're going to begin moving your blocks. You uh, Typically, all things being equal, infantry can move two spaces and cavalry can move three spaces. You're moving your blocks into the different spaces, and once they enter into an enemy's line, and that's something else that's very important here, you keep track of the enemy's line. Even if there aren't any units in there, they're going to place one of their markers. So you can actually see the, the front move, depending on whose kind of control markers you've got along there that creates the front. As soon as your unit moves into a front of an enemy, whether there's units there or not, it has to stop. Now, if there is enemies there, once you do, once you've done all your movement and you've got kind of where you're going to fight, you can go ahead and begin to place artillery units. So you're placing these different artillery tokens in the same way you place the fighters. They're face down. You may be bluffing. You don't know what you're doing. Your enemy, uh, he can. Now here you go one at a time. You just pick the space and you can figure out how you're going to do this. You reveal the the. Um, artillery on that particular hex, and then you kind of have an artillery duel. Now, all things being equal, you're going to hit on a 4 or a 5. If you are, pardon me, all things being equal, you're going to hit on a 5 or 6, but if you're in a fortress zone, and you're attacking a fortress zone, then you, the person who's attacking the fortress zone, his uh, rolls are only going to hit on a 6. The enemy, of course, can roll still on a 5 or a 6. So once you've done that, once you've done the artillery in that particular hex, you can decide you want to press the attack, in which case you can move forward. Otherwise, you're going to move to the next hex, do artillery there, and so on and so forth. Now, if you attack, there's several factors here you have to be aware of. Again, if you are attacking into a fortress zone, all of your, your hits are only going to hit on a 6. So it's very dangerous to go in a, a fortress zone. Um, the person defending still hits on a 5 or 6 like normal. Now, all things being equal, you can only have 3 blocks in a hex. But here is where this game is unique among block war games. These blocks have very high numbers. You can have one block, the highest block I think goes up to 20. So it's got, you know, on the four sides it would have 20, 19, 18, and 17. But then you've got others and all sorts of change. And you can constantly kind of make change with the units to get the numbers right. But this is something kind of unusual. Now, when you roll the die, I think there's uh, like 12 die in the bag. So you can roll up to the 12 die to get that. But if you've got more than that, say you've got, you know, 30 units in there, what you do is you only roll, um, I think it's three die, and then you consult a chart. And this chart tells you exactly how many hits you score uh, if you have that many units. So if you've got more units than you got dice, you just consult the chart. There's a chart for hits on fives and sixes, and there's a chart for just hits on sixes. Now, if you succeed, if you destroy your enemy there, um, before trench combat comes into play, which does kind of as the game progresses and in later scenarios, you automatically get kind of breakout movement. You can essentially move your guys one more space. Move your infantry one more space. I think cavalry can still move too. But you're moving these units into position, and they can attack other areas as well. They can move in to attack other areas as well, in which case it's called breakout combat, uh, which will follow... Um, but essentially, you can kind of keep pushing here, which is a very interesting and, and, and fun uh, way to way to kind of carry on the battle. Now, once the active player has gone and done all of his battles, then the passive player, if he becomes the active player, he then gets a chance to go ahead and make his attacks, uh, do the same thing with the artillery, with the uh, air reconnaissance, do the exact same thing in reverse, and you're going back and forth and back and forth like this. Now, over the course of the game, of course, the lines are going to shift, um, and you're trying to reach certain victory cities, you're trying to gain points. The uh, French uh, can, can kind of attack into Germany, and there's places they can get there. But the Germans kind of have more of an advantage of manpower. But just like the real war, even as they have the advantage of manpower, they're just bleeding so fast that it's counting for less and less as they move forward. So that's kind of basically what's happening here. Now, you're going, you're trying to reach those objectives. Once you get the, uh, once you get to the end of the scenario, uh, you go ahead and you see if you've got the points you need. Whoever has the most then wins Fields of Despair. 
So, Fields of Despair, uh, for, first of all, there's just a ton more stuff going on in this game that I'm not telling you. There is a ton of more things you can do economically. Um, there's more stuff uh, you know, that just appears in the game. Like I said, a trench warfare evolves that makes it your, your, your terrain much more difficult and, and harder to hit people and whatnot. Um, so, it, this is a very interesting game. Um, it's very interesting, too, because as you engage in combat, you know, you roll, then your, your, your adversary rolls, and then assuming no one's dead, you both just stay there. It's not you keep rolling until one of you is gone, so it creates this kind of static, um, static attritional front line, much like, much like the real war. Um, so this is a game of kind of, it's not a game of maneuver. This is a tough game of, you know, risking it against those fortresses or trying to bypass them as best you can. But it's it, it's hard. Now, if you do cut off enemies, they're they're out of supply. They only like attack it and defend it like half strength. So there's a lot of lot of other little things and little nuance going on in this game. So uh, what what do I think of Fields of Despair? Well, um, first of all, the theme. I'm I'm a huge fan of World War One uh, as a, as a I mean I'm a historian and I love learning about World War One, and I love it as a historical simulation, a, a game. It is a game. And I love, I love playing this as a game, uh, tackling that theme. And not just war games, you know. Um, there was the, the first World War years ago from Mayfair Games, which was almost more of a Euro game. Uh, you know, the Grizzled, which was a, a, a you know, pretty fun kind of card game set in World War I. Um, Wings of the Baron by Victory Point Games it was a great game about German aircraft, or I should, yeah, German aircraft production during World War One uh, about the companies. And I, I, I just, I love this as a theme, and I, and I do enjoy it very much as a war game. Um, so I love the theme. Also, I love block war games. I think I just like the fog of war, and I like how you're rotating them, and I like that. And what I like about this one in particular is these massive unit numbers that you're that you're sending on the board, you know, so it, it is attritional. It's not just one little battle and then boom, you're wiped out. I mean, most of these battles and these hexes can take two or three turns. Um, first game I played, I was up in, up in, uh, uh, it was the Germans and I was trying to attack, you know, the, the Belgians, I, I think in, in, is it Liege or Brussels? And I was trying to get through there and they kind of kept holding on and holding on. I'm in there with massive artillery and I'm just keep plugging away and they were holding me up. Now they were going to die eventually. They couldn't hold out indefinitely, but it kept me there for so long, it really ultimately kind of hurt me in the game. It's a game of just kind of slow, methodical, moving forward. But these battles, and when I say it's slow, I don't mean the game is slow. I just mean the push is slow, and it feels so thematic. And it, the, the battles, these hex battles, are so dramatic, and there's so much at stake, and you just want to cheer when you kill the last guy off, and you just want to cry when your attack is not going the way you want it to, or when the enemy punches a hole through your line you're not expecting, and it's just, ah, it's just aggravating. I love that. Now, the game, like I say, it has some of those abstractions. It has some of those abstractions like the Eastern Front and kind of the Naval War and the, 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 the production with the cubes and what have you. To me, it's kind of a mixed bag. I thought the the way they handled the Eastern Front, to me, I, I like that quite a bit. I thought that was that was pretty fun. Um, the naval warfare was 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 good as well, um, and yet one feels that the game probably, to me, would have been a little bit better if it had just maybe just focused on that Western theater and, and instead not try to be quite as grand and, and quite as epic. If it had been a little more localized, it, I think it would have clip faster, and I think I would have enjoyed it, because I felt like I was really getting into the game, really getting into the game, and it's okay, we got to stop, and we got to do the bookkeeping, we got to do this, we got to do that, and, and some of it was interesting, don't get me wrong, like I say, but it just, it it slowed down there for me. Uh, the, the pace of the game kind of got killed in some of that production phase, because it was so, well, there was just so much to it. If it had been simplified, streamlined a little bit, I would have liked that a little bit more. Um, one thing in production, though... <sighs> I kind of felt like you're spending the cubes for the different things, like technology and, and, and what have you. To me, that was a little... I, I, first of all, I wish there was a better way to keep track of it. I wish there was like a little, another little card you have. You do have a card where you can keep some things on, but I wish specifically for spending your, your stuff, you had some kind of an aid for that. That would have been helpful. And again, it just it, it kind of slowed things down a little bit, a little bit for me. Still, despite that... This is a brilliant game overall. The 
this is so much fun. I this is really one of the the most fun block war games I've ever played. It's so dramatic and so you know, I've said this a hundred times. I love games that, that give you tough choices and I love games that tell great stories and this has got it all, my friends. This is this is just a solid solid war game. It's not a short game. You know, you want to plan on a minimum maybe 3 hours for this game. Um at least that's been my experience, but you know what? Man, it's worth it. It's a fun game. If you like block war games, you like the World War I theme, I think you are going to love Fields of Despair. I love Fields of Despair. So the recommendation for the Discriminating Gamer for Fields of Despair is absolutely buy it. Thank you once again for joining us today on The Discriminating Gamer. As always, we ask you to please leave a comment for us on YouTube, on BoardGameGeek, on our Facebook page, or on thediscriminatinggamer.com. We ask you to please like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and follow us on Twitter. We are The Discriminating Gamer. And ladies and gentlemen, if you will indulge me, I'd actually like to read to you a passage, a letter rather, uh, from Captain Charles May of the 22nd Manchester Regiment that he wrote to his wife shortly before the Battle of the Somme, the evening before the Battle of the Somme, to be precise. <clears throat> I must not allow myself to dwell on the personal. There is no room for it here. Also, it is demoralizing, but I do not want to die. Not that I am mine for myself. If it may be that I am to go, I am ready. But the thought that I may never see you or our darling baby again turns my bowels to water. I cannot think of it even with a semblance of equanimity. My one consolation is the happiness that has been ours. Also, my conscience is clear that I have always tried to make life a joy to you. I know at least that if I go, you will not want. That is something. But it is the thought that we may be cut off from one another, which is so terrible, and that our babe may grow up without my knowing her, and without her knowing me. It is difficult to face, and I know your life without me would be a dull blank. Yet you must never let it become wholly so, for to you will be left the greatest charge in all the world, the upbringing of our baby. God bless that child. She is the hope of life to me. My darling, au revoir. It may well be that you will only have to read these lines as ones of passing interest. On the other hand, they may well be my last message to you. If they are, know through all your life that I loved you and baby with all of my heart and soul, and you two sweet things were just all the world to me. I pray God I may do my duty, for I know, whatever that may entail, you would not have it otherwise. Captain May died the next day. Left arc, still a two to six. Oh! <laughs> yes! A little scout. Yes!